Today we have the Pharisees approaching Jesus and asking uh, this question, a question that probably they debated amongst each other a lot as well. This is what Pharisees would do, especially scholars of the law, asking, what is the greatest commandment? It's kind of similar to what, you know, maybe what we do sometimes of, you know, what is the, the, the greatest baseball player of all time? What is the greatest state to live in? Which usually we answer in Minnesota, but probably not this week, right? Or uh, stuff like, like that. But this is what the Pharisees would have done, asking these questions, to deba- debating uh, these, these questions. And so in one way, they're definitely interested of what Jesus is going to say. What does he teach? You know, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of them all? And how does Jesus respond? He actually responds from scripture passage that state, states this, where it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. Remember, he, he, he notice here, he doesn't say it's exactly the same, but it's like it and it's second in place. And what is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So first and foremost, loving God. And then loving our neighbor. What does that look like? It's not just our, our neighbor that lives next to us. It's not just a fellow parishioner. It's, it's not just a family member. Uh, neighbor is, is everyone, including your spouse. And so what God is saying, what Jesus is saying, right? Who is God? Love me first and then love another individual after that. God first, everything and everyone else after that. It's very important to love our neighbor as ourself and to love our neighbor with that complete love, but it cannot be more than we love God. And why is that? Well, our first vocation is being a child of God. One of the great privileges I have of being a pastor, even being a priest, I actually talked to Father Riley about this a couple weeks ago. I said, Father Riley, what's been the greatest thing of being a priest? And he goes, well, you know, hearing confessions, being with the people. And he said as well, you know, learning how to do marriage prep. And that's a great joy that that priest have to be able to do marriage preparation because we're able to walk uh, with that, that couple along that path towards their marriage. And although we may offer a couple practical ideas about marriage, as priests we're not married, we don't know the ins and outs. The main goal of marriage prep is actually to help that couple grow closer to God. And when they do that, they're able to grow closer to each other as well. Usually the first meeting I have with the wedding couple, uh, we get to know each other, we we talk a little bit, and then I say, I got a a couple questions. And I I preface it usually by saying, I'm a philosophy major, so I I like to ask big questions. We start off easy. I go, why are you you marrying each other? And they say, well, Father, we we love each other. I go, that's good. And it's not a sarcastic way of like, that's good. I go, that's good. If you don't love each other, by the way, you probably shouldn't get married, Right? But then I say, what is, what, is the, what is the point of marriage? And by this time, the, uh, so we're into these questions, they're probably thinking, boy, we did not know it's going to be an exam. And then my final question I usually ask is, okay, you think that's the point of marriage? Well, then what is the point of life? And at this time, usually the groom's jaw drops, right? And uh, they also think, can we go back to talking about ice fishing instead? That was a lot easier Uh, to talk about, but I think it's an important question. What is the point of life? And so we go through all of those questions. When we get to that that point of life, I then answer the question as well. And and usually almost every single wedding couple do a great job at answering uh, these questions. It's it's, it's actually very edifying to listen of why they're getting married, what they think the point of marriage is, what they think the point of of life is. And then I just boil it down to, to what I believe the point of life is, is to glorify the Lord by everything that we do. To glorify the Lord by everything that we do. And when we do this, when we truly glorify him, when we serve him, when we make him the center of our life, everything else will fall in place. And not only that, we'll be able to receive that that fulfillment that we are longing for. And then we go back to what is the point of marriage? Well, it's to 
help each other to glorify uh, the Lord. Why are you getting married? Well, my spouse does make me a better individual. They help me uh, to experience Christ. They're going to help me to get to heaven. But it's not only in marriage preparation that we're called to ask these big questions of what is the point of life. It's something we should do often, actually. But so often it's, it's easy just to fall into, we could call it the, the rat race of life, where we go from one thing to the next to the next to the next, and we're just, we're just running. And we don't take time to step back and contemplate. But when we do, when we do step back, and contemplate, usually what's going to happen is we're going to go more in love with God. We're going to long for him even more. We're going to ask for his help even more. We're going to commit to try to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and in doing so, we'll be able to love our neighbor as ourself even better. As you know, this past year has been unprecedented in everything that's gone on. Of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown, the social unrest, and then Every four years, the political junk that happens as well. What we need to do is step back and think, what is it all for? What am I living my life for? Who am I living my life for? And of course, God should come into that answer. One of the godsends actually of the, the pandemic, although it's been uh, horrific and everything else going on. But one of the godsends was that it gave us an opportunity to step back. It was forced upon us. Maybe we didn't want to have it happen when the shutdown happened, but all of a sudden everything came to a halt and we were forced to step back and contemplate what is going on. I know for myself, I remember the first day that the shutdown happened. It was a Thursday morning, the day before, the governor and the archbishop uh, both said that uh, masses will be shut down for the public. And it was so hard to come in here that, that Thursday morning, and a couple of parishioners who had not got the message yet uh, were, were in the pews, and I said, I'm sorry, you can't be here. I didn't know exactly how, if I was going to get in trouble, if, you know, everything like that. It was just, we wanted to be very cautious at the time. And so to have to celebrate Mass in, in front of a, it felt like an empty church, empty pews, and it was, it was jarring. And as the shutdown continued, being up here and, and, and preaching to, to empty pews, celebrating the Mass, I remember one day, um, no one showed up, no one to run the camera, a deacon was home as well, praise God, it was good to take some rest every once in a while, right? But I'm all, I was up here, I was running the iPad, and it was just this empty feeling. But then I realized what a gift it was that God had given me in a very selfish way that I was able to come and receive the Eucharist to celebrate the Mass. And speaking with parishioners during that time expressed over and over again where you were longing to be here. You were longing to come to Mass. You were longing to come and pray and, and be in community. And although our parish tried to the best of ability to stay open, sometimes bending the rules here and there a little bit, right, where we're able to receive the, uh, distribute the Eucharist after Mass, it still was a, a hard time that all of you embraced. But I want you to go back there. Go back to that longing. Because before then, did we take church for granted? Did we take receiving the Eucharist for granted? Do we ever imagine a year ago that it would not be possible? And all of a sudden, when it was taken away from you, what were you longing for? More than likely, we were longing for God. Longing for the Eucharist, longing to be at Mass. I know even now there's, there's many parishioners who do not feel comfortable coming back to Mass. Praise God for uh, the Internet. Praise God for our, our YouTube channel. 
I praise God that we have the outdoor mass for, for God bless with all that great weather for since May until this week. What a godsend that has been. But also just that, that realization of how great a gift the church is. How great a gift this parish is for you, for your fellow parishioners, obviously for me as well. What we need to do is to continue to support this parish. Continue to support it because it means so much to all of us. In the midst of darkness, this parish has been a place of light, a place of refuge. As mentioned, we've tried to have creative ideas to to keep the parish going, to keep it open, to make it even more inviting. There's a couple of things that we've done. Obviously, I mentioned the outdoor mass. Uh, When the pandemic hit and shutdown happened, we we actually increased the amount of confessions being offered here at St. John's. We're actually hearing more confessions now than we ever have before. Is that because you're greater sinners? I don't think so, right? We're all sinners, by the way. But instead, I think it was that longing and to realize that it's a sacrament that we want to take advantage of. We've had adoration on on Wednesdays and and Fridays. We've added a praise and worship night once a month on on Saturday evenings. We're able to come and and pray and and, and adoration and go to confession. All these things being done to, to try to make this a place even more as a place of refuge, a place where we can experience God's love. And I believe actually our parish is in a better place now than we were a year ago because we've realized how important the parish is to all of us and what a great gift it is. And what a great gift God is too, that he longs for us just like we long for him. So because of this, we we need to continue to support this parish as well. As you know, we're in the midst of our stewardship campaign right now. The theme this year is faith, hope, and healing. And this parish is a place where our faith is increased. It's a place where we can receive that hope and a place where we come for healing. Not only in the sacrament of confession or anointing of the sick, But a place that I've seen parishioners come over and over, and non-parishioners as well, come over and over again and sit in the pews and pray and say, Lord, heal me of whatever affliction is coming upon me, whatever temptation is coming upon me. This is a place of refuge. And praise God for the support of the parishioners. We've been continuing to to keep the doors open, not not in a physical sense, because we always do that for the most part but opening up in other ways, keeping the ministries going, keeping opportunities for people to come and experience God's love. With that as well, as Pat Johnson mentioned last week in in this financial update of the parish, uh, he said, we have actually been able to fulfill all the staff positions here on the church side and the school side. We did not think that was going to be possible back in April or in May. Because of the support of you, the parishioners, we've been able to fulfill uh, fill those positions because financially we are able to do so. And what a gift that is. With the school as well, as, as Pat mentioned, our enrollment is up over 20% than last year. We've actually almost doubled the enrollment that we had when we first made the transition into becoming a Catholic Montessori school. What great gifts these are. But we need your help. We need your help and your financial gift uh, to the parish. And so we're asking you once again this year to to make your stewardship pledge. We want, if possible, a a huge participation of numbers, uh, not so much in the gift per se, but just to to fill out the form. And so that way we have a better idea of budgeting for this upcoming year as, as well. So if you could fill out that that form and make the pledge, it's not binding, but it helps you to commit as well, to commit to continue to support uh, this parish. We don't know what this upcoming year is going to bring. We do know one thing for sure. We know that this parish will continue 
to be a place of refuge, a place where you can come and experience Christ, where you can come into the light, leave the darkness behind, a place where your heart, your soul, and your mind can be lifted up to God and be filled with his love, with his grace, with his body as you receive the Eucharist. And so we're asking you, please, to continue to support uh, this parish. As you walked in today, hopefully you received an envelope from one of our ushers. If you did not already receive one uh, in the mail, we're asking you simply just to, to fill out uh, the form inside of there. I'm not going to go step by step. I've done that too many years, and I think you're all smart enough to know where to put your name on the form, right? Uh, but to fill out your name, address, your email, uh, your, your financial gift pledge as well. Also this year, we've added a section on back for, for prayer request. I do look at every single uh, form and, uh, and just to see if there's anything on there that I need uh, to see. I don't even look, hard, I don't look at the amount that you've pledged. But on that form, if you put down anything your prayer request is, I'll be able to pray even more especially for you and your family. I've mentioned this before, but every Sunday what I try to do at the end of Mass is pray. Pray for those parishioners I've seen this week and those I haven't as well. And during that shutdown, every Sunday after the 10 a.m. Mass, I would simply just sit in the church all by myself and pray for you, longing that you'll be back here one day and now, some of you are. Some of you are still online. Those prayers will not end. This parish will always be here for you. A place of refuge. A place where you can experience God's love.